Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning broadcast. Trust you're keeping well. God willing, next Sunday we'll be back in church at 11am, but we will continue our online ministry each Sunday evening at 6.30pm if you'd like to tune in. We begin our service together today with a song, Bless the Lord, O My Soul, 10,000 Reasons, sung for us by Shannon, Lucy and Kirsty. girls. Last week we had an update from the Irish Baptist College. Today it's the turn of the women uh, for an update on the work of women's ministry in our association of churches. I'm Gail Curry and I look after the Baptist Women's Department. In our department we are so thankful to God for his faithfulness to us in the past that has enabled our department to transition and evolve to where it is today. And we're thankful to God for his help in the present, especially in learning new skills with technology. He has provided us with tremendous opportunities online for hundreds of women all over Ireland to come together to study his word, to discuss his word and to pray together. And we look to God for his leading and guiding in the future as we continue to press on to encourage women in their walk with the Lord through the events that we organise, providing opportunities to meet with like-minded women when we can sit under his word and fellowship together. And we press on to equip women in their knowledge of God through the various courses that we run, courses that women can do together in their own local church, and other courses that we run in connection with the Irish Baptist College. 
all of these courses are open to women all over Ireland. And we press on to evangelise women as we motivate each other to see the need around us to reach out to a lost world with the hope of the gospel. Proverbs 31 verse 30 says a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. We want to be those women who fear the Lord, women who love God, women who love his word and who want to live lives to honour and glorify him. We're continuing our study today, the countdown to Christmas, and we're studying Luke chapter 1. Uh, John is going to read some verses for us from that chapter just now and pray before we come to God's Word. Well, good morning everyone. Hope everyone has survived the first week of lockdown. And I um, look forward to seeing you all again next week in church, holding well. Now, this morning's reading that Andrew's asked me to do is coming from Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. Um, Luke's Gospel chapter 1 and we're breaking in at verse 46 and this is Mary's song of praise for those who are familiar with it. Luke's Gospel chapter 1 and starting to read at verse 46 and Mary said my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour for he looked on the humble estate of his servant for behold from now on on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her own home. We trust the Lord will bless the reading of his word. And we're going to have a word of prayer. Our Father, as we come before thee this morning, we thank thee once again for the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, we thank thee for the good news that we have. And our Father, we thank thee that this time of year especially uh, points us back to thinking upon his birth. And our Father, we thank thee that uh, you ever didst have a saviour by thy side. And when all was going wrong in the world, our Father, we thank thee that there was one that could leave heaven and come down to earth. And our Father, we thank thee for that he was willing to take upon himself that humble beginnings and be born there in Bethlehem in the, in the stable and our Father we thank thee uh, for the Saviour that came into the world our Father that not just our Father to be a good example our Father but that he would ultimately go to the cross and our Father that he would bear upon himself the sin of the world our Father help us never to forget it our Father help us never to uh, think upon it lightly as we think of this Christmas period and how it has uh, we celebrate and our Father, it's very easy um, to put it to the back of our minds that actually that the Saviour came down, our Father, that he may take upon himself my sin. Our Father, we thank thee for this. For those that are listening in today that have still not yet put their trust on him as their Saviour, our Father, we ask thee that at this time that they uh, will contemplate the, the reason uh, for this season and our Father, that they will contemplate why we celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus and our Father, we ask see that at this time our father that they'll have a, a quiet moment to themselves to reflect um, upon the upon all that happened at Calvary's cross and that they'll just step out in faith and put their trust in Christ as their own saviour this morning our father we think of those from our church and as we can't meet together in the usual fashion we want to pray for those that are experiencing loneliness and uh, and episodes and periods of lockdown that's acutely exacerbated we just ask see that you'll know, you'll draw in and bless them and uh, and touch them and draw alongside them and that their loneliness 
sadness will be removed. We think of those that are sorrowing and those that have lost loved ones in recent days through many causes. And we just, uh, our Father, the usual mechanisms of friends and friendship and drawing round and, uh, and supporting them at this time have been removed. And we just ask you to bless our congregation who are going through difficult and sorrowing times um, through, through bereavement. And we think of those who are going through tests and, and, and our Father, those who are going through sickness and our members that we have in hospital and we're not going to name them our father we just you know who all's in hospital and we just ask see that you'll both bless them physically and spiritually and our father we ask that you'll guide those that make uh, uh, the life-changing decisions around them and decide how they should be treated and what medication etc to give them and we just uh, ask see that they feel this morning that those in car are remembering them and hopefully they maybe even get a chance to, to watch this service and we just ask see that they'll be blessed um, as they lie in hospital at this time. And Father, we ask thee to um, help Andrew as he brings a message before us this morning. We thank thee for um, the mechanism that we have uh, during these times when we can't meet, that we can still get the message out and that we can still um, gather together in, the, in our own homes. And we just ask thee that we might be, have a time of blessing this morning. We give thee thanks for the Lord Jesus Christ and we ask all these things in the Saviour's precious name. Amen. Thank you, John. Hopefully you have a copy of God's Word at hand as we study uh, these verses together this morning. Every December, music lovers, especially young people, are eager to see which song will be Christmas number one. In my day, it was Queen, Boney M, Pink Floyd, Band Aid and Cliff Richard. Last year, uh, Lad Baby made it all the way to number one with their instantly forgettable and hugely unlistenable song, I Built This City on Sausage Rolls. This year's favourites are La Baby Again, uh, Liam Gallagher and Jess Glenn among others. Whichever song makes it to number one will not remotely compare to this song read for us in Luke chapter 1 today. A 2000 year old classic, a timeless tune, Mary's song, one of the most profound songs in the history of the world, a song of poetic and prophetic genius. Last week we heard how the angel Gabriel revealed to Mary that she would conceive supernaturally and she would give birth to the Messiah, the Saviour of the world. And we saw her response. It was truly admirable. It was immensely spiritual. She said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. As we reflect on this song today, first of all, we see the background of the story and we see that Mary was submissive to the will of God. She was obedient. She was dutiful. She was submissive. Such is the character of this unique woman. Remember, she's only a teenager, maybe 14, 15, 16 years of age. And we must be conscious of the emotional roller coaster she is experiencing. Naturally, she was deeply privileged and honoured to be the one who would carry the Messiah, the Saviour of the world. But for a non-married girl in that culture, it would have meant in a few months' time the bump would begin to show and Mary would be the talk of the town, engaged to be married and now pregnant. Such scandal and such shame. Betrothal in that culture or engagement as we know it in those days was legally binding as marriage. The couple would have been viewed as husband and wife and only divorce could annul the betrothal. Of course, they would live apart until the wedding day. Such was the bombshell that landed into Mary's life. And she would be confronted by misunderstanding. She would be ostracised by the community, shunned, ignored, talked about. People would have assumed the very worst of Mary. And she went to visit her relative Elizabeth. Now, there's no hint in the story that she's on the run from the community. She, came, she simply went to encourage her older relative, Elizabeth. She made the way to, her, way to the hill country, a journey of something between 80 and 100 miles, taking her three to four days to get there. Now, Luke, in his gospel, has a very high regard for women who were viewed in that culture as second-class citizens. Two women here carrying two children, a teenage girl and a woman in her 60s or 70s, two privileged and two godly women, both pregnancies announced by the angel Gabriel, the forerunner to the Messiah and the Messiah himself, two women supernaturally blessed by God. The 400 year silence is over. God is on the move today again and women are at the very centre of his plan. And God revealed to Elizabeth 
that her younger relative, Mary, is carrying the saviour of the world. And there's no jealousy from Elizabeth. She is the mindset of her unborn son, John the Baptist, who would later declare of Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. And Mary launches into this song known for us as the Magnificat, uh, from the Latin for the word magnify. And as we look at this song today, we see that Mary was permeated with the word of God. This is the first and greatest of the four songs in Luke's Gospel. There are striking similarities with another song of an expectant mother, Hannah, in 1 Samuel chapter 2. And young Mary would have read that account of the Old Testament heroine and her willingness to hand her son over to the Lord's service. Remember, this is a girl who came from the place where apparently no good thing came. But this is a song bursting at the seams with, with Scripture. There are at least 15 Old Testament quotations or allusions in this song. Eight times Mary tells of what God has done on a personal and on a general and on a national level. She alludes to many of the Psalms, Psalm 22, 25, 44, 89, 98, 103, 147. There are also references to First and Second Samuel, the book of Job and Isaiah. Jesse Ryle says about Mary, she gives expression with her lips to what has been treasured in her heart. And what has been treasured in her heart is God's word, the Holy Scriptures. It is apparent that this young girl was permeated with the Scriptures. Now some critics, some liberal theologians argue that because of the theological excellence of the song, it couldn't have been sung by a young teenage girl. But they do forget that all devoted Israelites from their childhood days knew by heart songs from the Old Testament and they often sang them at home at family celebrations. This song is a great testimony to Mary's to parents' devotion to bringing their daughter up in the fear of the Lord and in the knowledge of his word. Now young people listening today, let Mary be a really good example to you today how important it is to know God's word, to memorize it, to meditate on it, and parents, there's a challenge for you as well uh, to follow the example of Mary's parents who brought their child up to love the word of God. May all of us as parents follow in their footsteps. We absolutely need to be permeated, to be saturated with the word of God. This is our sword to fight against the devil. We need to encourage the memorization of scripture. Psalm 119.11, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. It was good enough for Mary's son the Lord Jesus to use against the devil so it should be good enough for us. Make it a New Year's resolution uh, to make your way through all of the, the Bible in the entire year. There are Bible plans. You can get them for an, an app on your phone. It's very easy to get. Maybe read three or four chapters every day and make that New Year's resolution to read through the entire Bible in one year. And obviously to know the Word of God is, is, is the best way to pray. We pray Scripture back to God. We remind God of his covenant promises. We stand on the truth of scripture and we will see that God is always faithful to his word. We also see that Mary was devoted to the worship of God. Verse 47, my spirit rejoices in God my saviour. The astonishing truth is that the, the baby in Mary's womb was her saviour. And she's rejoicing in her saviour. Her heart is full of worship and adoration for God's grace in her life. My soul, my spirit rejoices in God, my Saviour. Literally, my total self, all that I am, magnifies and praises God. Mary needed a Saviour like everyone else. She fully understood the grace of God. And sadly, across our world today, there is a, a veneration of Mary, where she's considered to be the way to God in prayer. She is considered to be a, a co-redemptrix along with Jesus. She's viewed as being untouched by original sin. But Mary knew too well she needed a saviour. She knew she was a sinner. She needed someone to forgive her sins. And the one to do that was her son, the saviour of the world. Mary would be appalled today. That a future generation would see it fit to worship her. She knew her place and she was devoted to the worship of God. I wonder today as a Christian, are you caught up in wonder at the greatness of God's grace to you personally? Are you rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ again today in his unparalleled beauty, his unsurpassed magnificence, his unique love? Are you lost in wonder, love and praise in your salvation today? That God has rescued you and redeemed you. Is your heart full of thankfulness to him who bore 
your pain. That's why we normally on a Sunday gather for corporate worship, not to please the pastor, not to impress our friends or tick a box, but to worship and to magnify our great God, to glorify our risen, exalted, soon returning Lord Jesus Christ. May we never lose the wonder of worship, private worship and corporate worship. We also see Mary was thankful for the work of God. God had been good to Mary personally. She knew it. She was just an ordinary girl from an ordinary village who had been chosen in grace to be the most favoured woman in history. Verse 48, for he has looked upon the humble state of his servant. That was the same attitude as Hannah as she cried out to the Lord. Mary's honour that she would carry the great serpent slayer promised in Genesis 3.15. This is the way our God operates. This is how he works. He uses the unknowns, the nobodies, the anonymous to fulfill his purposes. Mary was so thankful for God's grace in her life and she is characterised by stunning humility. And this is a key attribute of a true Christian and it's so countercultural because our society is driven by self-sufficiency, self-centeredness, self-esteem which are all rooted in the deadly sin of pride. Our society uh, encourages the accumulation of gadgets and toys and the one with the most toys wins. But the Bible relentlessly condemns pride. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Micah 6 verse 8, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? Humility is the badge of Christianity. And it's the ultimate evidence in the grace in the heart of a believer. And we are, to be honest, tested continually to maintain our Christ-like humility. And whenever we get more responsibility even in church or in the office, in the workplace, more influence, more power, the greater temptation is to shun humility. Then we will be sitting ducks for the enemy. And Mary sings, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Notice she's not the one who will confer blessings. She is the one who was extraordinarily blessed. She's deeply appreciated the work of God in her life. Verse 49, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. Mary acknowledges that this personal God of salvation is mighty and he is holy. Can you concur with Mary today that he who is mighty has done great things for you? That should be our testimony. Despite the difficulties, despite the challenges, despite the discouragement, even despite the pandemic, he has done great things for us. Our motto text in car this year, 1 Samuel 12, 24, only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart for consider what great things he has done for you. Mary knew the God she served was of infinite power, the God who made the universe and the most astonishing thing for her was that she was carrying the Messiah in her womb, conceived supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. We also see Mary is familiar with the ways of God. Verses 51 to 53, we see that God's ways are not our, our ways. God's ways are that of role reversal, and he specializes in role reversal. Kent Hughes, in his commentary on the book of Luke, uh, pinpoints three areas of rule reversal. We will just uh, look at two of them today. First of all, there's a moral reversal in verse 51. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud. He has brought down the mighty. Those in the Bible who were proud in their own ability and their own achievements, those consumed by self-promotion at the expense of others, people like Pharaoh, Haman, Absalom and probably most memorably Nebuchadnezzar who would eventually fall down and acknowledge our, of our God for all his works are right and his ways are just and those in walk in pride he is able to humble. Our closing hymn says this powers and dominions lay their glory by proud hearts and stubborn wills are put to flight the hungry fed the humble lifted high. This is the God Mary sang about in verse 52. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones. He has done it in the past and he will do it again in the future. And as we look at the annals of history, people like Bloody Mary, Napoleon, Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, Pol Pot, Saddam Hussein, Colonel Gaddafi, enemies of the gospel. And they're proud in their hatred of God. But where are they today? 
Yet the Lord Jesus Christ is building his church, still building his church today, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer were preachers of the gospel, and they were faithful to God's word. And Bloody Mary had them arrested and sentenced to die, and they were burnt at the stake in Oxford on the 16th of October, 1555. Latimer died much quicker than his brother, his friend, and his brother in Christ. As the flames quickly arose around him, Latimer encouraged Ripley, Be of good comfort, Mr Ripley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. The faith they once died for is now freely practised in our nation. Our God is the God of Romans 8, 28, who works all things together for the good. He is the God of role reversal. But there's not only a moral reversal, there's also a spiritual reversal in verse 53. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. This is a, a wonderful gospel picture. The general but not universal rule is that those who are materially poor will much more readily understand and grasp their spiritual poverty. The rich young ruler missed salvation because he was unwilling to forsake his riches. The indictment against the church at Laodicea was that they were rich and in need of nothing. Most of the people the Lord Jesus encountered in the Gospels were materially poor. His mother, Anna, the fisherman, the madman of Gadara, the prostitute he met in Luke chapter 7, the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Desperate, hungry, needy, vulnerable people. But whenever they met him and were converted, they went on their way rejoicing. And the Lord Jesus in his best known sermon emphasized the significance of spiritual hunger, the fourth beatitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled, they shall be satisfied. Those who are deeply aware of their spiritual need shall be filled with Christ. Remember today, the ways of our God is the ways of role reversal. And his son, the Lord Jesus, reversed roles. Left the splendor and the adoration of heaven for the womb of Mary to be born in a stable, to live a life of obscurity for 30 years in a forgotten province of the Roman Empire, to be part of the despised Jewish race, to be subject to Mary and Joseph, to be obedient to his heavenly father, an obedience that would take him all the way to the cross, the king of glory on a cross. What a rule of verse this is. Bloodied, beaten, naked, scourged. Yet at the very centre of God's will for his life. Uh, but listen right now. He's in the position of highest honour. Listen to these verses from Philippians chapter 2. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. And this is the way our God works. He doesn't run to the world leaders. He doesn't do business with the proud. He doesn't side with the affluent. He comes to the lonely, the broken, the poor. He works with those who fear his name. And if the Christmas story tells us anything, it's that God leaves self-made, self-sufficient people to work out their own way, to flounder in their pride. He doesn't come to those who are self-sufficient and think they have life all worked out. He's on the side of the lowly and the hurting and the humble. I know as you're watching this today, many people in our country have had a very troublesome 2020. The pressure has been cranked up. We probably have faced the most challenging years since the dark days of World War II. 2021 may not be any better. But Mary would tell us to reflect the on the truth of Luke 154, the ways of God. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. God never abandons his people. Even and especially when they're under the couch, when they're under pressure. His mercies are new every morning. His faithfulness is ever so great. Mary looked back to the covenant faithfulness of God, to his ancient people, to the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12 verse 3 that all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. 
We are the spiritual seed of Abraham. God is faithful to his covenant. God always keeps his promises. And the promise for God's people is that the ultimate rule reversal is set in stone for us when our God will make all things new in heaven. And the memory of pandemics, family breakdown, depression, financial struggle, cancer, loneliness, abuse, bullying, insecurity, bereavement will be erased for our minds forever. Listen to these words from Revelation chapter 21. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. What about that for a role reversal? Always remember today as a Christian, God keeps his promises. But his promises to us come at exorbitant and extraordinary cost to him. Because to satisfy God's justice, to fulfil the covenant, the Lord Jesus had to suffer the wrath of God in our place and on the cross to be made sin for us. A few months after this incident of Mary's song in Luke chapter 1, Simeon held Mary's baby in, her, in his arms. And he told Mary the chilling news that a sword would pierce through her heart. And Mary would see that prophecy fulfilled as she would stand at the cross and watch her beloved firstborn son dying the most horrendous death, dying for her sins and dying for our sins. No one would have understood the moral perfection of Jesus more than Mary. She had watched him for 30 years in her home, entirely sinless, totally obedient, infinitely worthy, and no one loved Jesus more than his mother Mary. And her grief would have been compounded as she stood weeping. And gazing at her son upon the cross. If you're watching this morning and you're not a Christian, you're not saved, not ready for heaven. The challenge for you this morning is once again to come to the cross and to gaze at that cross and to see what the Lord Jesus endured for sinful humanity on that cross. The angel told Joseph he shall save his people from their sins. He is the saviour of the world and to save us he had to die in loneliness and in abandonment on that cruel cross. And the great news this morning is the work of redemption is finished. Hopefully today you realise your need of a saviour. I commend this saviour to you. There are no other saviours. Come to him today with all your sin, with all your baggage, with all your regrets, with all your doubts. Repent today and believe this glorious gospel. Trust in this perfect and powerful saviour. And then you can join with Mary in singing, My spirit rejoices in God, my saviour. The truth is Mary was a very ordinary woman. But one used by God in an extraordinary way. Totally submissive to the will of God permeated with the word of God, devoted to the worship of God, thankful for the work of God and familiar with the ways of God. Her life and her testimony point us not to herself but exclusively to her son, her saviour, the great saviour, the only saviour and the soon coming saviour and we thank God for his word to our hearts today. We're going to hear that hymn that I mentioned, Tell Out My Soul, uh, written by Timothy Dudley Smith, take, words taken from the Magnificat in Luke chapter 1.
Let's just close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for another opportunity to sit down today and to study your precious word. Thank you that your word is forever settled in heaven. Thank you for Mary's song. Thank you for a woman who was literally permeated with the word of God. Thank you for that, the fact that she was saved by your grace. She needed a saviour like everyone else. And we just thank you for the remarkable truth that her son was her saviour and he is our saviour too. Help us as your people, Father, to be caught up in love and wonder and praise at your greatness and your grace in each one of our lives for saving us, for rescuing us, for redeeming us. May we be ever thankful for your amazing grace in each one of our lives. We do pray as we close for anyone listening or watching this morning still outside of Christ, still a stranger to this grace. Dear Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would work in hearts and draw sinners to yourself. We thank you that you have made provision for sins in the person and work of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. As we continue the countdown to Christmas, may we all remember the reason for the season that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. We bless you for another day of grace and we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you for watching. God bless you.